Right, evening everybody, or well, depending on what part of the world you are, morning or afternoon, welcome. And what a pleasure it is for everyone to be here, myself certainly. Um, welcome to the first of the BTRM, Bank Treasury Risk <coughs> Management Programme, series of faculty risk forums. Now these are, as it says on the tin, where the faculty get together and they chew the fat on risk, specifically bank risk, balance sheet risk, and uh, hopefully come up with something of reasonable sense and sensibility and even, heaven forbid, value added for anyone who might be listening in. So, uh, and it's my real pleasure to, to welcome the, our part of our faculty to this first event, the Faculty Risk Forum, uh, both those in the room, hello, and those online. And I hope you can hear me clearly. Now, someone asked me the other day, you know, what is the BTRM, what, what, what's, what's that all about? And I said, <laughs> that's, there's two answers to that, right? And I said, um, you know, one can go along to an academic institution and, and listen on a lecture, and the chap there will be teaching you out of a textbook, a textbook that 99 times out of 100 he or she didn't write. Uh, or you can go along to, you know, one of these training companies that hold courses for these professional exams, and again, they'll be teaching out of a textbook. Whereas on the BTR, of course, I have, and it's a privilege for me and a pleasure, uh, a faculty have actually done this for real at the call face. And that accounts for a lot, I would think, in terms of value added. So, uh, it, it, as I said, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce part of our faculty for the first of the forums this evening. And um, what, what, a, what an esteemed panel it is. Uh, from, uh, from the far end I have Mr. Chris Westcott, a uh, former colleague of mine at RBS Group Treasury, where he'd also held the role, his most recent role was in the Basel III Programme Office, but before that he was also the Retail Banking Division uh, Treasurer, a uh, long and distinguished career uh, at the group uh, pre, pre, pre and that West days as well. Uh, welcome, sir. Next to him, uh, Mr. Graham Walvart, a colleague of mine, there's a pattern here, right? Uh, a colleague of mine uh, from Arab Bank days, uh, still there, Europe Arab Bank here in London, where he's head of market and liquidity risk. The thinking man, CRO, or thinking person CRO, I would say, or in fact, the CRO's CRO, I described him once to somebody. I'm not sure what they thought of that. Uh, so welcome, Mr. Wolvart. Next to him, a close personal friend of mine, as they all are. You're getting a pattern here, right? Uh, which is uh, Mr. Peter, a former colleague of mine, <laughs> from uh, J.P. Morgan Chase days, uh, where he worked within commercial paper, asset back commercial paper, origination, uh, structuring, and a long and distinguished career there, and subsequently at Merrill's. And now, again, a pleasure for me and a privilege to have him on the faculty. And next to him, next to him on my right, I must admit, not a former colleague of mine, but a close personal friend of mine, which is, uh, which is uh, Chris Edwards, who is Head of Treasury at uh, FBN Bank here in London. Again, a long and distinguished career within the city. So, uh, if anything, we're all long in the tooth. So, um, that's, but that's hopefully not long, uh, not short in, in uh, value add data that we, we come out of this conversation, that we come out of this conversation. So, that's the introductions. I'm going to kick off with a few topics that we have advertised and hopefully are of interest to those of you in the room. And then um, at some point we'll take questions. It's generally about an hour or so, uh, give or take. And uh, at any time, of course, if there is a burning question, please raise your hand and, and we'll get into it. Uh, forgive me if I have to repeat it, because for those online. Uh, and then, of course, we'll see if, if, if any of the panel can indeed answer it. I'm sure they will be able to, to your satisfaction as well. Okay, so let's kick off then. Um, the first topic for conversation is a general one, where I would like to invite each of the panel to give me their opinion on what is enveloping us all around, which is of course the mountain of legislation with respect to regulation on bank risk, whether it's Basel III, CRD IV, anything else you care to name. Specifically, to what extent is is this a business model changer? See, I like to differentiate BTRM from the rest of the herd with respect to conferences and panels where you go along and you hear the party line. Uh, I'm more interested in what should I actually do as a result of all that is enveloping me. Okay? It's a bit like when, I don't know if you, think of it, if you agree with this, um, it's a bit like when one read Black Swan, you know, Taleb, by Ta Taleb's book, which be fair to the man, you know, he's dined out on it ever since and it's made him many millions. But uh, my overwhelming impression of reading Black Swan was, um, okay, thank you for pointing that out, now what shall I do? <laughs> right? And he was a bit short on that. So let's see if we can 
fill the gaps on that one. So kick off then, Basel three, CRD4, liquidity and capital, specifically liquidity. To what extent is that a business model changer? Do banks, whether they're large banks, small banks, multinational banks, take your pick, do banks have to, are they required to change their business model in any way or not? And if they do, what is your prescription for how they should be looking to change it? Who would like to kick off with that one? I'll give you a few comments. <laughs> like. Mr. Westcott, please. Okay. Um, so, when I started thinking about this, the, the first point that struck me was that if you go back and look at uh, banks' liquidity positions in the 70s and 80s, you will find that they held a huge amount more in things like liquid assets than they ever did in the early 2000s. Um, and then we just had a progressive uh, reduction. So, I mean, in very rough terms, core liquid assets in the 70s would have been 10% of the balance sheet. Uh, core liquid assets in 2007, 2008 might have been 1 or 2% of the balance sheet. So there's a massive fall off. Um, so what, what we're seeing now is some kind of return to where we started. Um, and I would say a pretty necessary uh, return as, as well. Um, in terms of uh, changing the business model, well if you carry on exactly as you are, to my mind, uh, and banks have a lot more in the way of liquidity costs that they've got to meet because they need to hold more liquid assets, then uh, maybe they could carry on exactly as they were. Uh, they would, if they charge nothing differently to their customers, they would find themselves making a lot less in terms of margin. So, uh, the, some kind of response is necessary. Um, in terms of what, what, what you tend to see happening is, I, I would say, a response on many fronts. So, in some areas, you might see nibbling away at the pricing. Um, in other areas, you'll see an encouragement of, of new products. So, for example, if we just take the liquidity rules, comes as no surprise that there was a wave of 35-day uh, notice accounts. Uh, why? Because somehow they, they actually overcome the rules. So you, you see that kind of response in terms of uh, new products. That's with um, respect to taking it out of the liquidity coverage ratio metric, right? Uh, that, yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely right. Yeah, should have explained that. Um, and then I think that there are certain types of business that it's very hard to justify going forward. So if you are, were, or are, or were a bank with a very heavy uh, wholesale market funding requirement, and that wholesale market funding requirement is quite short term, you are going to find it very, very difficult to exist under these new rules. So therefore, it, it's kind of <coughs> forcing banks to make some changes there, um, because uh, at the minute it's kind of simplest form, if all your funding is under a month, then you have no choice but to invest it in liquid assets. Otherwise, you won't make the liquidity coverage ratio. So, to an extent, yes, it's going to force some changes to your business model. Thank you. Uh, just to remind, uh, again, <coughs> it's probably the hardest for you, Mr. Westcott, because you're the furthest away. It's but just to split out the house. Yes. Right. Okay, sorry, Eugene. Uh, okay. Can I just pick up on the Before you do, sir, I just want to summarise that for Mr. Manager, which is uh, very shortly, which was essentially, yes, for banks that... The business model changer is essentially higher costs because the liquidity cost is higher. Okay, we understand that. But it may impact in, in higher prices or new product types or a mix of both. Or what about pulling back from certain areas where the model just doesn't fit high liquidity? I mean, that, is that a possibility as well, right? So there is a, a significant business model impact on certain firms that aren't, aren't liquid. Or Okay, right. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, great. To some extent, I think that the changes, both the LCR ratio and the NSFR, are going to drive a return of business models to 1980s banking. So, you know, you can expect to see much lower returns on equity and capital employed. Um, and I think that that's. Let me just stop you there. That's quite significant. So we should just accept lower. We should be planning for a lower return on equity. So rather, you know, let's put a number on that. What is reasonable? Six to eight percent. I have no idea what, 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 the, what the end game is going to be. Okay, go on. Uh, sorry, however, sorry. I, I, can, I can 
guess that it's going to be a lot lower than uh, than than was anticipated, say, in, in even in the dark days of 2009. Uh, some people envisaged that this would happen, but I don't think anybody thought that returns would 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 go as low as I think that it being experienced by some banks currently and certainly will be in the future, even by the major players. Um, having said that, you know, perhaps that is not a, it, perhaps that is exactly what the regulators are intending, is, is, is a drive to a simpler business model which is driven by what you would call traditional core banking operations, which is uh, borrowing from retail depositors and lending to corporates. I'm glad you said that rather than lending to emerging market sovereigns. Okay, so, um, <laughs> and so, but the problem is they haven't actually defined what they mean by simple core banking. I mean, is this John Major, back to basics? Sorry, forgive those who don't know British politics, John Major. You don't really need to know about him. But um, um, is, what, what do we mean by that? Is it all simplified banking? I mean, it's a complex modern world, right? Absolutely. And I, I think that I think perhaps... Um, these efforts will have unintended consequences, w which will be less than optimal. Yeah. Okay. And I certainly see that the the, the sheer volume of regulation and the, the the sheer complexity of some of the bits and pieces that are coming out are, are looking at the fundamental review of the trading book, which is now the standardised approach to market risk, is going to make it very difficult for I think second and third and fourth tier banks in terms of size to actually just comply. So I think there might be a hollowing out of the industry, and this is my favorite soapbox. Moret has heard this at least 20 times before. <laughs> at least. Uh, and I think that this may, may be a really, really nasty and unintended consequence in that what you will find, what, what I think might happen, is you would drive consolidation in, amongst the larger and upper second tier banks uh, and the the, the, the the vast majority of the, the middle sized banks would find it very difficult to continue with their historical or traditional business model and find themselves either being absorbed or broken up and what you end up with is a lot of very small niche players and the enormous flow monsters with very little in between. Right, I mean that's quite a significant prediction there. It's, um, it's quite a significant one. It's, so it's a thought. It's, and it's, <laughs> it's a parad um, there's a there's certain logic to it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Is, the is there a paradox there that the regulators want to encourage more competition? They're mad for challenger banks and yet the impact of all this regulation is to survive it you're either going to be you know to grow and be large because that the cost base is so significant or be a small niche player um, and nothing in the middle. So that's going counter to what is intended here. Absolutely. Okay. But, Which is but, but you have to bear in mind that a lot of the um, well, people, the banks that have been a, a, around for a while have legacy costs in terms of the deposit bases that they've built up and the business that they've become involved in, whereas the challenger banks don't have that. They can pick the low-hanging fruits or the market areas that they want to enter and, and you know, set the dials for their business accordingly. And I think that there are cost savings there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else comment on that? Or yeah, I, I, I have, I have Mr. Edwards. One small point. The thing that frightens me is, is while I think you know, the regulators have the right idea, you know, going back to 1980s style banking, you know, they, are, they are perpetrating by putting people into, as they call them, high quality liquid assets, into a, a very small, a small um, uh, area where um, we're now dealing in rates that we've never seen before. So, you know, you're turning around, we, we paid Germany um, 0 0.04 for them to take your money for five years. And, yeah, what it, Nice work if you can get what, it. What, I, what frightens me is that you know, I, I don't think a lot of people in the market today have any concept of what could potentially happen. Yet, in, in very simple terms, the West is reflating. I mean, it's reflating like mad. Um, it's made the same mistake as Japan made. It's cut rates to virtually zero, and it's had this massive disinflationary effect. And I think um, by doing that, you know, we, we, we're driving bond prices down. And everyone thinks you know, that the core markets are going to be liquid. They're going to be fine. We can always get out. 
I dispute that. And I think, I think what you're saying, that the, the very structure that used to support the market makers who would put their capital to work to support these liquid assets, they're not there anymore. You saw, you saw what happened in the currency market, which is meant to be probably the most perfect market <coughs> in the world, and you saw that dislocation. Um, yeah, it's 120 to the euro, Swiss franc. I saw on Barclays 65, 75, 10 big figure price on their platform. And no deal was honoured that dealt below 80. Now, what would happen if, for some reason, um, yeah, rates just move? Whatever it is, something that you know, nobody, nobody can foresee now, and tomorrow we have 5% rates. You know, how, all these banks are going to take the biggest hammering you've ever seen. And, and, and they yeah, won't I, have capacity to make markets for their clients either. But we're no, all going to try to sell but, them but, more. But the, the regulators know this. Mark Carney, <laughs> November 2014, much reduced market making activity. Fundamentally, liqu liquidity has become much more scarce in secondary fixed income markets. Uh, yeah, interestingly time, enough, time, time to liquidate a given it, it, position is now seven times so as we've, long as it is. So we've seamlessly moved from monetary <laughs> to monetary policy. Nicely done, gentlemen. Thank you. As the, as the chair, I better bring you, bring you back on. <laughs> I'm not saying there was a lot of logic. There was a lot. Yes, I blame you, Chris. There's a lot of Chris's in this room, so he doesn't know what I'm talking about. Um, I look. Uh, that's a fair point we make. I'm sure we'll have time to come on to this wider picture there. Um, just on that point there on the business model. So it's quite significant, and I think, you know, again, we want the theme of tonight is what should I actually do? So if you're a risk management practitioner, whether you're in the finance department, you're in the risk department, you're in treasury, or indeed. I mean, I, I think if you're head of corporate banking, you still are a bit of a risk manager. Maybe the chapter in H boss didn't know that. But, um, you know, I think if you're a risk manager, what should I actually do is the, is the guiding light for every forum of the BTRM. So the point is, okay, it's a significant business model changer in some respects for, certainly for smaller banks, high cost of liquidity, certain areas are not profitable, return on capital's got to come down, seems to change your business model. And I, my view, my observation is the banks are moving quite slowly on that. But let's see. Okay. Now that's the 64,000. 64,000. That was a. That's a very high flying aeroplane. That's a 36,000 feet view. Let's um, move on to um, onto some specific topics again with the what should I do view in mind. Okay. And there was one, uh, Mr. Westcott, that you raised uh, earlier, which I do want to c cover, which is secured funding, which seems to be all the rage. Regulators seem to love it. Regulators love secured funding, but they also don't like very high asset encumbrance levels. So there's a bit of a left-hand, right-hand issue there, right? Uh, but we'll kind of come on to that. But there was another topic which was advertised, which I want to cover first, and I think all of you will have an opinion on this. Um, the liquid asset buffer itself. So, Mr. Westcott, you pointed out, you know, as all we did, that there's the need for more liquid assets. There's the LCR. There's, there's the net stable funding ratio liquidity metric. But there's the whole numerator of the LCR. You know, it's got to be all liquid. Chris, your point. Chris Edwards, your point on, you know, some of these assets aren't actually liquid in a stress event, which I completely agree with. So that's the point here then. Liquid asset buffer. I'm required to hold X percent of the numerator of the LCR in level one liquid assets. There's a lot of different opinion on this. Most of it I disagree with. But um, making the liquid asset buffer genuinely liquid, okay, as an ALM manager, as a risk manager, as a CRO, as a CFO, as a CEO, what have you, as a treasurer, what should I ideally be putting in it to make it genuinely liquid? Through any foreseen and unforeseen, you know, unforeseeable stress event, what needs to be in? I have a view. <laughs> yes, I have a view on this. But let's uh, let's kick off uh, with any views on that. Uh, what, what what makes it genuinely liquid? Because I can quote chapter and verse on loads of people who tell me they want to put, you know, tranches of RMBS in there. You know, they want to put equities. They want to put this, that, and the other. Um, so, what do we think? How do we make the LAB now? You could put a hat on of someone who's at an HSBC style institution, or you can put a hat on as someone of the smallest bank in the world, anything in between. What makes the LAB genuinely liquid? What would I mean, you do? I have, I have a strong opinion that I, I just cannot understand why the regulator did not insist that, say, 30% of your lab was held in cash. Yeah. Because that's the only thing that's truly liquid. Okay. And um, you know, the whole idea of liquidity asset buffer is not to make lots of the money. Yeah. It should be looked upon as a cost to the business an insurance policy. Okay, okay. But people are not using it like that. And no. the people have gone down the curve in this current environment have actually been rewarded enormously. 
And the danger is, you know, they think this is a norm, and they're going to carry on with that just for the wrong point. Okay, a, a fairly <laughs> clear answer there. Thank you, Mr. Well, I mean, it, it depends upon your view as an institution. If you think that nothing is going to be truly liquid in the event of another crisis, why not maximise the utility of this otherwise dead asset? And then you're the central bank's problem. <clears throat> Exactly. I mean, this is this is definitely the thought process. I think that some people have at least internally gone through and said, right. you know, this is this is it's it's not going to be liquid no matter what it do unless I put it all in an overnight placement at the central bank, and in the case of Europe, earning negative rates, and your well, alco and your alco and your <laughs> and your uh, your CEO is going to go, no, you're not, <laughs> and, and you know, very quickly. So. To some extent, I think there might be an, uh, a fatalism and say, you know what, whatever I put in here, is, in the event of a true stress, is, is not going to be much use to me at all. So I'm going to try and maximize my returns. And this is a return to short termism that we, you know, that, that, that all of this so is meant to be. It's another paradoxical. <coughs> okay, so again, so what would, let's say I say, I've got a dream job for you, right? You're going to be grim treasurer of a very large bank. What's your LAB going to be? And you're, so far, I'm hearing it should, a large chunk of it, should, let's say 50% for the sake of argument. You said 30. I was actually proposing 50 in my last position. But um, let's just say a large chunk of it should be cash. Should we not be insisting that that's the case, or that that's too politically unsustainable so people can go and put their want in it? Well, ch ch cash will probably be the cheapest now, because if you look at what's going to what, what's going to happen with uh, with the the the, um, the total bond issuance in 2015, 2016 is about 800 billion dollars is going to come out of the, you know, the, the available assets because of QE in, uh, in the Euro area and QE in Japan. Uh, the end of QE in, in the US is not going to put in a, enough back into the system. So in terms of truly, if we want to define truly safe assets, we're talking really US, uh, um, Japan, Europe, and arguably the UK. And they're just going to be fewer assets around. So, but you, if, you're if, talking about. But the if there's ultimate. fewer assets, just hold it as cash. You don't need to. Exactly. Oh, exactly. The ECB that would be the cheapest the EC, to do but that. the ECB that seems like Alice in Wonderland monetary policy book. I mean, look, like, we keep going about back to monetary policy. Um, it, you know, if if you're worried about that, if one is worried about that, then of course cash is the answer. But not in the eurozone because you have to pay for the pleasure. So again, they're kind of making it difficult for banks to actually follow a conservative liquidity regime by saying you can't place cash at the central bank, which I thought was the liquid answer to the LAB. Okay, uh, that's fairly, I don't, I'm not getting any dissension here, but then I've picked my team carefully. A any other comments on that? I would just say, um, by creating the LCR, you're better than where you were. So basically you're saying you've got to have some stuff that you have a potential to sell. You can't just simply be funding the loan book. And um, the chances are less that you're going to be calling your central bank saying, by the way, I can't roll over my market debt, my CD, and if you don't help me, I'm, I don't have a bank in 10 days. We're, we, we, it's a huge stride in improvement as it is, and you won't know it's exactly liquid. So I would say probably just try to think about diversification of the lab so that there is some chance that a good percentage of that, of that number will be, will be potentially, you'll find a bid for it. Okay. Uh, good. Yes. Yeah, just um, so I actually think the CRR and the Basel side of things is, is quite good on this, at least in theory. Um, so they, and I, I won't go through them all, but they, they basically list eight factors that uh, your liquid assets should have if they're going to be useful in a stress. And it's things like concentration, market makers, the, the, you know, those kind of things. And well, there's eight of them together. Um, the one that really I find difficult, however many times I look at this, is when in level 2B someone mentions equities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's there again. Equities, yeah, yes. I don't know why it keeps coming back. <coughs> um, Politics, right? It's, well, it's, it's a must, banking it lobby, isn't it? Yes. It must be. And apart from I mean, Graham's point on kind of dead assets that bankers are quite happy to stick in there, um, I, just, I just find that one difficult, or the most difficult out of all the possible uh, I heard assets. That. Yeah, but, but, I mean, I, I, I find equities. Kind of well, yes, it's it's a, I, I find equities difficult. I find tranches of structured finance securities very difficult, mm -hmm. right? Um, I find 
you know, A-rated corporate bonds, you know, you're only a, a, a whisker away from being triple B rated, uh, you know, especially in the stress event. I find a lot of that difficult, and yet I'm allowed to hold this 40% of it. So, you know, I just think, you know, that that's, it's, this is one of those occasions where you don't necessarily, well, a well-run bank, in my opinion, wouldn't, one wouldn't necessarily just follow what the regulator is asking or allowing you to do. One would adopt a conservative approach oneself. But again, you've got certain people on, on the ALCO, whether it's um, you know, the head of a business line or the chief exec or the CFO saying, look, we need to extract more PNL out of it. Uh, I just think they've kind of lost that. They've missed the plot. I, I, have, a, I have a small point. You know, I, I agree with the fact that diversification is really important. I mean, yeah, you're saying no to equities, but equities in the right sector might be a fantastic diversification to have if we do reflate and inflation takes a hold and the bond markets collapse. You know, um, those equities would probably go through the roof. So, you know, in, a, in effect, you could actually um, take, take away some of your risk by being in, you know, it might be, dare I say, you might be in the commodity sector in that, in, in that environment. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's He's out of the place box. To be He's out of the box. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Yeah. I know. I know. No, it didn't I, take long to convert him. Well, um, okay. I think <laughs> yeah, that surely in, in, in anything you look at. Well, yeah. look, we could. We, yeah, we, there's, there's never enough time to discuss these things. You know, diversification. You know, genuine stress. Everything has a unity correlation, right? Everything heads south or down. Risk on risk. Yeah, I just, mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't. That whole portfolio theory, Markowitz thing, on. I don't buy it in a stress event. But look, we don't want to get waylaid, chaps. I, your point taken, Mr. Edwards, point taken. Uh, I have a question. Ask, uh, question. Just a quick question. Um, in means. regards to the contents of the lab, should there not be some scope with what you actually are required to post out from the downgrade? So for example, if we've got a contingent IA where we can post out Portuguese, Gullies, Hungarian, etc., it doesn't seem to make sense to me that we have to hold this amount of cash against that. Like it shouldn't be cheaper for me to be downgraded and post out IA to the counterparty than to hold it in the lab now. Uh, fair point, yes, very fair point. I, uh, forgive me, I was just going to, there was a question on screen, but I didn't see your hand. But yes, absolutely. Anyone want to take that? Anyone have an opinion on that? No? Okay, well. Well, not half of them, I think I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the panel's view is, uh, agreed your point that okay. that seems a little nonsensical. Yeah. Um, uh, it, I, I must admit, I, I don't see the logic of it. Um, One of the um, unintended consequences, I think. Yes, absolutely. So, um, okay. Uh, more on. just yeah. as ratings downgrades being mentioned, just just ten seconds on it. In the, Go ahead, sir. Certainly, but uh, my experience is that banks are nowhere near where they should be in in terms of understanding the consequences for them for any ratings downgrade. Yeah, um, we certainly learned about that uh, four or five years ago, um, and in in terms of these new liquidity policies. But one of the key elements is kind of what I call doing the basics well. Uh, and we, all as bankers, have got an opportunity to do it a lot better in future than we've been doing it in the past. And to my mind, ratings downgrade is one, one of those very big areas because basically banks don't know. And they keep finding out, you know, we have a ratings downgrade and then suddenly everybody wants collateral, be it Portuguese bonds or anything else. And, <laughs> and they don't know where it's coming from. Uh, and they really should be, uh, certainly, the the bigger banks uh, should be a lot better informed than they are. Isn't that, now that's a very good point, and just in case, um, I will always keep urging you to speak up Mr. Westcott, but just in case <laughs> that wasn't that on mine, um, you know, the, whole, the whole issue of ratings downgrade for banks needs to be better understood, better analysed, you know, the impact of a downgrade on the institution's balance sheet with respect to liabilities outflow, higher ask for collateral, lower value of collateral that one holds, all that good stuff all that complicated stuff needs to be understood. Completely agreed, and that's a very point very well made. Um, I just wonder if, isn't that the whole point of the stress testing regime, if it is designed specifically for the institution rather than just being taken off a, a textbook? Um, shouldn't the stress testing regime for capital and liquidity have a large element of what do we do, what's our response, and what is the impact if there's you know, a material downgrade, a credit rating downgrade? Shouldn't this, isn't the problem here that the stress testing regime isn't fit for purpose with respect to that particular risk. Is that an issue? Well, I would say it's not sufficiently developed yet. Um, we're we're uh, on that side, we're, should we say, still tackling the big issues um, as opposed to getting into some of the, should we say, the smaller nitty-gritty. Yeah, okay, agreed, okay. Um, 
there is a, a chap on the line online has said um, LAB. And this is the last one on the LAB, right? We could have a whole separate forum just on the LAB. Um, LAB and repo market. What is the panel's view on whether lab assets, liquid asset, buffer assets, should be at all times available for repo? A lot of people would like that idea a lot, and thinking that that is another, another, that that makes the asset that much more interesting. Um, but so I don't. We can I, we can see the. P and L driver of that the answer to that question. Yeah, but that if you can't sell it, you might be able to repo it. Yeah. So a lot okay. of people like that, but um, I think we can never get too comfortable with collateral because well, you go back to the J.P. Morgan quote: "If um, I wouldn't lend you money for all the collateral in the world if um, I didn't think I was you were credit worthy." Yeah, absolutely. So, that's, yes, that's that's but, traditional. But, uh, that's absolutely. That's what I always used to <laughs> forget security. If I wouldn't lend to you unsecured, I'm not going to lend to you secured. Yeah. Which, but that's not a common yeah. view. But that, but yeah, I think that's um, that's an interesting thought. I think that um, is, it's, it's another tool in the toolbox. Is is there a question as to whose control this is under? I I, I think that's the underlying thing. Is yeah. as long as yeah, the, the issue is I, I should be able to get hold. I should be able to get it back at instant access. Yeah. yeah so it, so the answer may be yes, but but it's. From my perspective, a no if it means that, that the control of the asset is going anywhere other than the treasury function. Uh, right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you mean internally? So it's a treasury, I mean, you know, there's a, to me there's an operational risk here because, in theory, I may be able to get hold of the assets back instantly at the instruction of treasury. But in practice, is that still the case? And I think there's an operational risk issue here. So it might look good. You know, I can get some extra juice out of the LAB. I reap out the assets. They're in my control. I can get them back when I need if I need them. But actually, is there a time lag? Is there a is there a control issue? I think there's an operational risk with that. So I wouldn't be, as a treasurer again. So you know, conservative in everything, right? Uh, well, not everything. Certainly when it comes to bank ALM. <laughs> uh, I just think as a treasurer, I, I may have an issue with that. But in theory, I agree with you, Mr. Eisenhower. You know, it's but it's certainly while you're in the lab, there's not supposed to be any encumbrance on the assets. Yeah. It's not supposed to be. Uh, collateral for something else. It's not supposed to be used for a hedging purpose, or it, it's supposed to be there for the lab. Okay. Thank you. Anything from the floor at this stage? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Let's go on to um, something that I found. And I need to leave time for that whole Basel Committee consultative paper on standardised changes to standardised RWA. I bet that's got you excited, as indeed all papers from the Basel Committee do. I'm sure you agree. Um, <laughs> let's just. Here's a specific topic here, but again, what should we do is my, my guideline, my gu the, the guiding light for this forum and all forums. Mm -hmm. Secured funding and covered bonds. And this is something you raised, Mr. Westcott, but I'm sure others have an opinion on this. Secured funding and covered bonds. Uh, if I'm right from your agenda point, um, worthwhile or not worth the bother, or something like that. Was that your... Was that your <laughs> well so why don't, you, um, why don't you kick off on that one? What do we think of uh, secured funding? Because... As I said earlier, the regulator likes it, but at the same time, the regulator doesn't like encumbered assets or a certain level above uh, encumbered a certain level of encumbrance. So, what should be our policy on that, or just what should be our view on this? What do you think? Let's kick off, sir. I'll try and speak up. So, so when I started thinking about this, uh, I became quite comfortable with everything vanilla. Um, so, if, uh, in my past. I got as far as working on vanilla type transactions. Um, and just a, a few observations. Uh, certainly anything outside vanilla, um, the legal documentation is normally so complicated that uh, those that are involved in originating the transaction often can't keep pace with it all. So uh, a master trust uh, Thankfully, I only got involved in one of those, but uh, I was gobsmacked when I found out there were more than 100 legal documents. <laughs> and when the sentences are often uh, run to three quarters of a page, and it's three <laughs> o'clock in the morning, and you're trying to work out what on earth it's saying, I, I don't think you can justifiably protect your organisation when you're trying to take that in. Um, so uh, I like. Vanilla securitization, clearly it helps the wheels of commerce and financing and everything uh, flow. Um, there are a few other elements that, that for me don't quite work. Um, 
So I don't know if there's any views from my panelists or from the floor, but I always struggled with the total return swaps that were used <laughs> because to me, they didn't, it didn't feel like arm's length. It felt like, tell me what return you're making at the moment and what return you need on the bonds, and that's what will stick in as the swap, <laughs> as opposed to something that felt arm's length. So, <laughs> I've never, don't tell the JP Morgan, Peter, surely. <laughs> I've, I've never been comfortable with that, but I'm happy to be corrective. Anybody's okay, got no, any other views? Thanks very much. Let's, uh, so in essence, to summarise the essence, when you say vanilla, you mean the structure. So just a, a yeah, single, simple. A single chance. Simple. Like it, say, let's say I put a residential mortgage, I just do a single transaction, uh, mi minimum number of... There's always going to be legal documents, yeah, this, this yeah. high. Uh, a simple structure uh, of uh, a prime vanilla underlying asset class and you know, just it's well understood, so you don't have that many complex legal documentation around it. That's what you think is the worthwhile part. Once it gets yeah. beyond that, it's no longer worthwhile. And also, there is a very fundamental point, man, which I haven't come across in any other, um, you know, in any other uh, text or publication. So you know, you heard it here first, and thank you for raising it. Once you get into complex structures where the legal documentation is so onerous that virtually no one outside of a small circle of lawyers in the law firm that you are paying a lot of money to actually understands what they mean. There is an again almost an operational risk there as well. You know, when you say you can't, when you say you're protecting the firm, I've not heard that or read that anyway, and I think that's a significant point. Okay, it's well worth raising and well worth repeating. So complex structures, you know, we should see the end of master trusts. I, I also worked on, so I know exactly what you mean. Um, you know, they're, they're more trouble than they're worth. Um, so that's a fair point. Now, anyone else want to comment on that? Well, in terms of the initial setup costs and then the additional costs uh, required to look after the, um, the, those products correctly, I think, doesn't e ever get folded into the, the running cost of, the, uh, of that liability. And if you did fold that cost in, they might not be so attractive. Okay, so there's the, the genuine value for money element as well. Yeah. Does the originator actually understand? Does the Treasury Department understand exactly. the all-in costs? Because they've probably been borne by other people in the organization okay. to some extent. Okay, so, so again, a practical point about do, does, one, does the firm actually understand its genuine all-in cost base for a secured funding transaction? Okay. And I think um, as well, um, so many bank treasuries came to the point where they said, these secure transactions, I don't get any capital relief anymore. These aren't off balance sheet, so I'm not getting anything out of that. So I have to then take this and say, um, what's the sales pitch to the investor out there? And basically, is the deal well, you use up my your credit line to me. Will you lend me more? If because I've got this secured structure, and maybe you like the secured structure because you're lending to that pool of assets with that strategy, and you're not lending to a whole bank where my chairman tomorrow can make some disastrous loans or <laughs> buy the wrong bank. So that's that was the sales pitch we tried to put to people. We also said the it's a second pe pair of credit eyes on the structure, because the rating agencies have to like what's going in there if the structure is rated. So those were all the sales pitches we made. And the question is, did we get bigger credit lines for banks, because they had the secured side as well? And I'm, and not, sure you, we, I'm not sure we did. Because that's Be the fundamental question. Because many people said, I, the sponsor of the structure is so important to me, and if I don't like the bank that's doing the secured structure, it's not gonna, I'm not going to be impressed. So. The only, that was a good question to ask. The, the only the only sales picture I think that's probably possible here is is looking at your NSFR, where that kind of thing, particularly for the smaller players like my institution, you don't have that many um, uh, you know options on the liability front in terms of filling that long term <coughs> maturity, and that may drive okay the, you know, again the, coming the back to the security help you a little bit more. Okay, so where so we so for example take NSFR a really good way to solve any NSFR pressure would be to go ahead and just go ahead and issue a five year senior unsecured floating rate note. Yeah, you're saying there will be a large chunk, there will be a large number of a material number of firms that don't have that access. Whereas on the other hand, if they securitize part of their corporate loan book or what have you, they get that access and it relieves the pressure on the NSFR. Um, okay, that's I mean, there's pros and cons to everything, and I personally would see the logic in that, and I can see how a treasurer would prefer that solution to Alco. Um, but I suppose there's still the issue, as you yourself said, about the all-in cost, and as Chris raised about, Chris Westall raised about, 
the yes. complexity of it. And your friendly relationship, your friendly neighbourhood relationship banker, may well be suggesting a more complex situation uh, solution than than one might need. Absolutely. Okay. I, I did like uh, Mr. Westcott your comment on total return swaps. Um, I think a synthetic structure where it's a risk transfer trade. Um, Sometimes you know you tr you genuinely try to, you know you get significant risk transfers. The PRA gives you red cap relief. A synthetic structure may be a solution, but I find they were getting horrendously complicated and uh, compl unnecessarily complex. Um, so if anything that rolls back that complexity is, I think, a good thing. When, when, it's, when somebody said roller coaster return to me for the first time, I, I lost <laughs> I lost my will to it. Is that is it? I mean, it's, it's, it's a white knuckle. Right? Um, um, the other, uh, Peter, you said about rating agencies. I mean, the rating agencies, and you know, I, I've never had any. I've always thought, you know, you understand their methodology. They say it says what it says on the tin. You know, you understand what they're doing. But they themselves rated, you know, some horrendously complicated structures. Yes. You know, they, they and they got, got a fee for that, didn't they? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they got sucked in. Well, leave the fee element out. I, I, I just think that they got sucked into, you know, rating things that were just unnecessarily complex. Um, yeah. But okay, that's a fair point. I think as a as a action point for an ALCA or a treasurer to take forward, you know, just keep the structure as simple as possible. Because if you're in a, you know, a, a situation that you're in, uh, Graham, you know, sometimes it may well be the only solution. Yeah. Okay. Can, can yes, I jump in with you mentioned uh, next time funding ratio, and uh, it's just a, th a point that's got me thinking. It is going off on a little bit of a tangent, which will probably upset more. Ed, but uh, <laughs> what is it, monetary um, policy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, that's mine. Um, <laughs> For smaller banks, the yeah, net stable funding ratio is going to be an issue of getting um, long, longer term longer term liabilities. And uh, yeah, for most of the challenger banks, uh, banks like ourselves, we're involved in the fixed rate savings market. Um, it's quite interesting that um, there was a, I read something in a paper the other day, they were, they were estimating that there were about, in, just in the fixed rate space, about 145 billion of um, um, saving money. Yeah, there's a lot more in the internet access and everything else. But what's happened um, uh, in the last month, we've got this new pension bond being launched. Now, if you turn around and you look at the, as the fixed rate space, probably the most um, liquid is the one and two year. You know, people don't like to fix for too long. They don't think they need the money. They get a bit nervous. So, yeah, this is just a if you say 80%, you can argue, I might be totally wrong, but if you say 80% is in the one and two year, that only leaves 40 million, uh, sorry, 30 million in the, um, a billion, in the longer dated fixed rate space. And you've just seen three year bond at 4% when three year gilts are yielding 0.58, issued by the government, that's gonna soak up 30, 30 plus percent of that pool. Um, could the you know could that cause a problem for some of the smaller banks, and you could get an imbalance in uh, demand and supply, just to get longer dated liabilities in that part of the curve? Right. Uh, Is, uh, am uh, I just? Yeah, uh, no, uh, I, no, totally I think I think the problems uh, that problem uh, that problem exists, but I think there's a much bigger problem, and that that is that the, the smaller banks, I, I, for instance, my institution, our deposit base is pretty fixed. Uh, we, we, we're not going to even see any part of that hundred and something billion. <laughs> we just billion. aren't. We, all, of, all, of that. All, all of our liabilities are going to be inside one year. Uh, pretty much certain of that. And it becomes very, very tricky then to work out how are you going to term out your, uh, your liability structure so that you can then meet the requirements of the, the NSFR. But that's but, where your secured funding comes in, right? Exactly. So you get, but that's going to be a new product for us. We're going to be having a, looking at new products. And, Somebody actually said to me, why don't some of the smaller banks get together in a club and issue their own notes? Well, what's the and regulator I, in the room at the time? And <laughs> I, 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 I thought, I, I just, I don't even want to go anywhere near that. But, uh, but, you know, this is the kind of thinking that people are having to do because it's not, the, it's not straightforward to, to plug this gap. But, you know, they're, they're, there's the authorities actually reducing that availability. That's why, you know, they come out with this great idea. And I'm thinking, as a taxpayer, why are you doing that anyway? It's not joint but members. also, also, they're not even thinking about the the effect on um, that pool of that pool of liability. 
and yeah, I just a different else department. I think there's a lot. Of, <laughs> it's just, it just made me think. <laughs> there okay. are a lot of issues around that particular <laughs> bond issue. Okay, Th thanks, gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, th thanks for us, Mr. Evans. Um, anything from the floor at this point? No, I haven't tickled your fancy just yet, have I? Right, well, I will this one, I bet you. Okay, let's get up. This is, this, I'm surprised this one hasn't made more running in the, how shall I put it, you know, in the space, in the media, business media space, in the chat, in the comments, and research notes issued by the various investment banks. Um, the, uh, the recent Basel Committee's <coughs> consulted a paper on uh, re-addressing, re uh, reappraising the approach to standardised risk-weighted assets. I have uh, one or two chaps to thank me for bringing that to my attention recently, because I must have missed it myself. <laughs> thank you, sir. Um, so, Basel paper, consulted paper, re revising the calculation methodology for standardised risk-weighted assets calculation. Um, I just wanted your thoughts on that. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, take a look. It's on, it's on as is all their papers, on the BIS's website. Changes to standardised RWA approach. Uh, I just wondered if uh, the panel had any thoughts on that, and you know what, what uh, you know whether it was uh, what the impact might be on the business model and just generally risk practice. I'm I'm, I'm going to open my mouth again, and then I'm going to stop. Um, <laughs> That's um, the the uh, I, I did have a very brief look. I have to say I didn't I haven't read it in, in any massive depth. But the thing that struck me was that immediately the when you when you're a bank our size, in terms of available information to populate the ratios contemplated by um, the BCBS, you're going to be looking at financial statements uh, for, for a lot of our corporates that may be up to 18 months old. They also may be in various geographical locations which are applying different accounting standards. And I'm not sure that you've got a net you know, a net increase in the quality of data that you're using to generate these um, uh, these risk weightings when compared to um, ratings agencies um, external ratings. I, I'm not. Sh I, I don't. I don't but, see for us very, very good net point. benefit in data. Let me just quick, so very very important. So I mean, the whole point, just for those of you who aren't instantly familiar with this, it, it's all uh, the point about revising the approach to standardise RWA was to remove the reliance on credit ratings of the obligor, the external credit rating agency ratings of the obligor, and rely more on granular level asset data, so the asset quality of the, the data on the quality of the, under <coughs> the actual lent assets, you know, the, the asset base. And um, so, as you say, Graham, it becomes a data management exercise. You need this detailed data plus histories, as you did before. But this is now standardised, not IRB. And also, there was a reliance on annual statements, and um, we know what we think of that. <laughs> uh, has anyone seen my heard of my rough rule of thumb for how much money a company is making? The thicker the annual report, the less money it's making. It's a good rule of thumb. It works all the time. <laughs> um, so there is that as well, and, and I just share your view on this. Um, but I wonder if anything else on that point. I I wouldn't complain, I wouldn't say I'm the greatest expert in this area, but it just really struck me if if Moody started rating American railroads in 1860 and developed a whole rating practice and has tons of data and is generally very good <coughs> with default. Okay, they they rating agencies made some mistakes with structured finance, but I I don't. I think they do. Uh, they've got a huge bank of history behind them in terms of rating banks and sovereigns and corporates. And now you're saying, well, okay, we're going to do the risk. We're, we're going to do the risk weighting for your bank assets based on two ratios. <laughs> yes. And the same with corporates. Um, I, I just, I thought that was that came for me from out of the blue. I, I, I really didn't know how you got there. I, I didn't see it as an improvement. I agree with you. I, I didn't see that as an improvement. I. I I thought if they were simplifying something, to, you know, to move away, so you had a simplified approach, with with less reliance on, you know, unreliable data. Yeah, and then it made sense. But exactly, I exactly we shouldn't be road and just follow data. There should be a qualitative yeah. assessment as well. So, so I, I think the other thing too is, you know, what is the impact on capital here? Because for banks, you're saying you're going 
from well, we were always twenty percent risk weight. Now it's thirty to three hundred. So now, yes, for the first the time, we can yes. go well beyond a hundred percent risk, risk yes. weight. No, um, so what does that really mean? And I, I thought it was very interesting in the paper <clears> that they talked about um, they were using December two thousand fourteen data. Um, they're going to do a whole qualitative impact study to see, or quantitative impact study to see how much capital this is really going to cost, and if they implement this, what does it really mean? And I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of that. <laughs> a lot less lending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which ties back yeah, to our first, I, I, the first I, I, question you asked. Yeah, yeah. I, I did. The regulators. Again, on the uh, plus side, the retail mortgages, the, the lowest level is going down. Yes, um, where 30, 30, so the thirty percent to, to oh to, yes twenty five percent risk weighting, yeah. where the mortgage is very high quality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So for example, the, lo the loan to yeah. value is low and it's prime and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, whereas if any if if it's a mortgage that isn't of the bestest prime quality, then it could be quite a much higher oh, yeah. risk weighting. Isn't this overall though a mechanism for making standardised look like IRB? And then ignoring the IRB answers. I'm Isn't glad you said that. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. I, I thought standardised should be simplified. In fact, they seemed to me that they were making standardised standardised more complex, so it encroached onto I, foundation IRB territory. And perhaps maybe that's their intention. You do away with foundation IRB. I thought the one you wanted to do one the one one would want to do away with is the advanced IRB because the data there is so <laughs> you know skewed and uh, you know self interested that. Um, you know, I, I don't like that concept at all, but it did seem like maybe, yes, maybe the intention is to make it more complicated so that it becomes a bit of a foundation on RB. My personal preference would to make it simpler, but um, there you go. Do you think it's calculated and they're trying to um, move away from higher risk areas? So, you know, it, it, it's, I, it's targeted question. very much against sure, the capital uh, hit. Yeah, the capital hit. That, so, it could well be. It's difficult to know the mindset of moving uh, up to three hundred percent. I just what it is is uh, one of us needs to be appointed to the Basel Committee, and then we'll be all right. The BCBS, and then they'll be doing all right. I think um, I'll say something on that. Uh, oh, Enrique, yes, please. We've yeah. got a coming to Chris' point. I mean, I think that's a very good point because in fact, there's a twin paper that covers that area. It says we scrap the Basel one floor and we into a new floor. The standardised approach gives you your new benchmark. So your capital will have to be above the standardized approach capital requirement. Mm -hmm. So it, can, it comes to be an IRB benchmark effectively. And, you, and you think that's their... To be above that. Okay, and you think that's their intention? Well, it's, a, it's, it's the twin paper that were released on the same day. It's yes. The same people <laughs> doing the same Couldn't thing. Couldn't be a coincidence. It's, it's effectively it's coming to a risk, it's more a risk-based approach calculating capital. Yeah. And that, that then begs the question, um, you know, what, what would be the motivation for actually running an internal model at all for, for your capital calculations, with all, all the expense and, and, and resource and effort that that requires? Yes, absolutely true. Yeah. It's just... Which, which is probably based on KMV models. Mm -hmm. Which come from the rating agencies anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so just for the just for the tape, just for the tape. Uh, the comment from the floor was uh, yes. I come. I'll come right to you. So the comment from the floor was uh, this approach is actually based on the KMV, which is a Moody's developed model anyway. So I guess the output will be similar. Um, Etienne, please. Maybe just one point related with this. I mean, it's maybe misguided the way that we do this, but I think there's a lot of one of the ratio is the leverage, and I think there was a, some other paper published. I mean, research paper showing allegedly that the leverage is anti-cyclical. And I think one of the things we would like to, to, to introduce is measures which are anti-cyclical and something that when things go, go square shape, uh, the, the, the capital is increasing. And I think that's probably the, the idea where it's coming from. But like very often, I think it's a, it's a good observation and probably a wrong answer. <laughs> yes, okay. Right, okay. Yes, okay, thanks very much. Uh, comment on the line. Um, I wonder which impact, I wonder what the impact of extensive regulations will have on innovation in the financial industry. Does it bring us back to, in inverted commas, the stone age? Many banks have ex exited exotic products and have reduced the catalogue of products eligible for trading. Adding a new product under new rules is so time consuming that it might be only interesting for flow trading of vanilla products. Now, before um, I invite the panel to comment on this, very interesting question or comment uh, we should remember two things one is um, 
was it uh, Paul Volcker's comment that the uh, only yeah. innovation he'd seen was um, the ATM machine? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a pity, actually, that he said <coughs> that. I, I wish someone had told him about interest rate swaps. Because he fixes his mortgage, does he not? Oh, well, he doesn't need a mortgage. Um, okay, there was that. But then there's the other point about, I mean, do we really need any of these exotic products? It's a good thing, isn't it? They all these exotic <coughs> things that banks have been done for mis-selling to various SMEs. Nobody really needed them. But um, even leaving that aside, specific value value judgment and value, value, uh, value judgments, um, what about just the general concept of innovation, which I would say in any industry is a good thing? Is there a danger of that just... You know, being stifled out and existing, yeah, just we just go back to the vanilla age, which I think Graham was a comment you were making. So the, the issue for me is is um, not innovation. Innovation to me means uh, solving a no uh, a, a real world problem with a creative solution. I I, I think that that it, there there will always be um, space for innovation in that sense. I think innovation in the sense of gaming the regulator and making it too complex for him to follow, or exploiting your customers or counterparties for gain, is probably something that you wouldn't want to encourage. And I think that there would be some benefit in reducing needless complexity. Yeah. Which Derek Turner would have said with his socially useless trading. And, yeah. uh, ex exceptionally, yeah, I, I, I agree with, uh, with that comment personally. Um, I think that a lot of the stuff wasn't particularly needed. Um, and you're right, genuine innovation is just, I like the way you've defined it actually, genuine innovation is just that. You know, we've got a problem, the solution is something that hasn't been tried before and it's a, it's a good solution to the existing problem and needn't be complex as long as the solution is there. I think one of the innovations that is going on that's maybe a bit frightening is maybe certain forms of shadow banking, um, maybe peer-to-peer -peer lending. <coughs> <laughs> and it comes back to our, you know, our first point about changes in the business model and new costs on banks. And so our non-bank competitor is going to set up yes. without the same safeguards and rules doing banking. Um, we've certainly seen it in the asset management space. Those guys have run around saying, hey, we're the nice guys in all this. We didn't cause any of the problems. And they're trying to be banks without the regulation. So. Uh, okay. There's certain innovation that's, that's, that's got to be watched. Yes, but absolutely. But absolutely yeah. I, I, just to pick up on that, um, new entrants to d d banking type services, a Apple is only the most recent, okay? To me, this is um, entering into competition by gaming the regulations effectively. It's exactly, um, unfortunately, I. I I'm, I'm not a fan of Uber and Lyft. All you do <laughs> is running taxi services without any of the safeguards of traditional uh, taxi services. And the, the same can be said for the new entrance, uh, the Silicon Valley entrance to the banking space. And yes, it is having a, an effect, I think, on net interest margin. And those are the, the entrants, uh, I think, are, who are going to pick the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that, um, that currently is giving the biggest banks the best returns. Uh, and and, and I, I do think that kind of innovation is not terribly useful. An interesting take there, thank you. I have to watch these chaps, they love to go out onto the <laughs> real philosophical ones. Um, look, we got um, by the clock, as I've capped this at um, 60 minutes, I have by the clock two minutes to go before I see any remaining questions. I've got just a topic to finish up on, which gets us right back on what should I do if I work in risk management at a bank. The role of the ALCO Asset Liability Committee, a pet topic of mine. Uh, the, what, what, what is best practice for a bank's ALCO, Asset Liability Committee? How much genuine power and control over the balance sheet should they have? Should everything, you can probably guess what my answer to this would be, should everything go through ALCO or is it purely a committee that reviews liquidity and interest rate risk? on the banking book, liquidity risk on the balance sheet, interest rate risk on the banking book, and nothing else, or should its role be widened out? What do you think, what you, would you recommend as best practice for a bank to be considering? And it, and it has to be, it has to be a lot, lot broader than that, in my opinion, and it has to include liabilities as well. That's what I'll say on that. Oh, okay, all right, sort from sweet. Anyone else? Mr. Westcott, you must well, have opinion, well, a strong opinion on Alco. Well, my view, it's, I'd rather call it Alco process. So. To my mind, it doesn't have to happen in an ALCO, but there's a, a value in the, the should we say, 
the Treasury team, for want of a better word, or the ALM team, uh, being involved in the, in the key decisions. Um, and if, if you just think about some of the, should we say, some of the ugly things that have gone wrong, uh, on some of these, I think a Treasury person in, in having a voice may have made a difference. Yeah. Others, they wouldn't. So things like you know, swap mis-selling, this ridiculous thing that because the deposit's higher, I've got to pay at a higher rate, which doesn't necessarily follow and definitely doesn't follow <laughs> with the LCR. Um, uh, lifetime guarantees on products. So, I mean, a lot of our banks will still be stuck with some of those. And that was a decision somewhere <coughs> in a bank about 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of us are still suffering because of those. And which the ALM function wasn't involved in? Well, quite, quite possibly. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, everybody comes in with a different motivation. So you've got a marketing person, uh, a salesperson. You just need to make sure that you've got uh, an ALM person and not just, should we say, a finance person, which was probably the, the history in that ALCO process. Okay, so you just you, you like the idea of it doesn't necessarily have to be in that monthly meeting, but the ALCO process should have a wider remit and review of the balance sheet. Okay, any other comments on that? Could I just add in that you, you might feel that as well that the risk department should be playing some role in some of these things mm -hmm. as well, and, and sometimes I think it's the power of the voice that is, is what's a question, because often those observations are made, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're just uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. put to one side. Yeah, and, and I, I, mean, I agree, Ian, and the difficult thing is it's not a great deal of use turning up 10 years after it's all gone belly up and saying, <laughs> I told you so, <laughs> because no one wants to know then. But I, I, it's almost, it's a, it's a collective mm -hmm. voice, so the, the risk function in, the, in its broadest sense Basically, it always struggles to compete, uh, uh, and so it has to keep trying and keep getting in there and almost not keep bending people's ears. But and that's a very good point you make. But doesn't that call for the the the, the authority of the committee to be formalised? <clears throat> See, that's my my. You're absolutely right. It shouldn't rely on individual personality or an individual. You know, uh, some people are a bit more zealous with their role than others. For example, it should rely on a formal authority. Uh, for example, make the ALCO, you know, give it board delegated authority. For example, so that that's in that the framework has that control mechanism in place, and so you don't have to rely on the individual because some individuals do a good job and another individual will do not so good a job in the same role. It, it, let's take away that reliance on that, and then give the formal authority for the entire balance sheet to a committee like ALCO which may have a political issue because, of course, people say, well, that should be the ex-co. Although, in fact, practically speaking, there's a lot of commonality in membership between the two anyway. But I just think the solution is to formalise this greater authority rather than rely on the individual, you know, making sure that their, their voice is heard in the right forums. I wonder if that's a process. And I think that still isn't 100% bought into by banks. And then that, that's what we've done. There was also specified that things ALCO must look at, and they include things like market risk limits, okay. uh, funds transfer pricing framework and the le levels at which they are set, which Im impacts on the pipeline lending, which also gets reported at that meeting so that the Treasurer has sight of what's coming down the pipe. And okay. those Excellent. things help if they're Agreed. built into the terms of reference. Precisely right, yes, exactly my point, if it's formalised. Okay, uh, now sadly, Time flies when you have a, a good time. That's, we've come to the end of the, uh, the uh, formal part of it. Do we have any questions from the floor or anything you want to run by the panel? Just wanted to make a point. You were talking about asset encumbrance and liquidity. And, and one thing I think that gives the regulators a lot of security is the low levels of encumbrance they're enforcing on banks. Yes. So ironically, we talk about levels of liquidity and we're allowed to buy all these RMBS up to 40%. And so it, the lab is going to become less liquid with the new regime. I think one of the things behind the regulators' general views is they can now bail out just about any institution by taking raw loans in place. So I think they're probably more relaxed about where it is. Um, so whilst it's, we don't like this encumbrance limit because it doesn't let us do all our nice RMBSs for long duration, actually there's a motivation there behind it. I think that probably isn't as explicit, but gives a bit of safety. Okay, yes, just, for, just to comment on the, the regulators' view on encumbrance. 
I mean, in my experience with them, in the last two roles I've had, like, that's, this is something that they don't have an explicit limit for, but they verbally will say to you, you know, for your institution, we're going to raise our eyebrows if, if it reaches X percent. For those of you online who may not know what raising eyebrows actually means, um, <laughs> it's just a reference to how when the re regulator starts to get concerned about some aspect of your balance sheet and gives you a phone call. Um, okay, anything else? <laughs> Nothing online? Nothing in the room? In which case, oh no, Vijay, yes of course. Uh, just a question back to, uh, to Graham, I think we talked in the, the first point about uh, returns going to 6 to 8 percent. I didn't uh, say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think I said I thought that was a, 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 a realistic, sustainable return. I thought that I thought six to eight percent was a realistic, yeah. sustainable through the cycle return, given all the issues on competition and costs and blah blah blah. Uh, not everyone agrees with me. So my question is: Do uh, asset managers and others who invest in bank capital, what, what, what do they think about? Spot on. Absolutely. What, what do they think about? That's that? exactly. Are they kind of uh, kind of uh, have a reset? their expectations to this new level, or are they still demanding 15-20%? I can only talk about our investor. We are wholly owned subsidiary, and I haven't seen any evidence of a reset in thinking <laughs> as yet. You've, you've, actually, you've actually, and that doesn't surprise me at all, Graham, you've actually hit the nail on the head, BJ, because the point is, this is the reality of it, but from what I could, you know, if you look at bank share prices, where they're going, what the, the shelter is expecting before they want they think the share is worth more. Well, the fund manager is thinking, I don't think they have realized this. I think there's a large body of opinion, on whether it's banks themselves or fund managers, I think we're just waiting for the good times to come back. Uh, I, I agree with the uh, ex, uh, that gentleman who was at uh, PIMCO, new normal. Uh, the new normal is very low interest rates, trillions of quantitative easing, and uh, much lower returns over the next 15 years. So. I don't think they've had this reset, which is a problem because until they have the reset, that's your shareholder. You can't then go about saying this is my new business model. Mm -hmm. So that thinking is. is but at least the bondholder well. loves us. <laughs> <laughs> the bondholder loves you. Yes. I mean, they, they look at they look at what else? What, what's the alternative? Um, yes. Um, I wonder what they think of bail-in though. But isn't that what they always should expect? They should have always accepted and expected a kind of bail-in because, after all, I am holding the debt. Um, They're willing to buy the cocos. Yes, the true. Yes, cocos. Cocos are going very well. I like cocos for a purely academic reason, in that they actually give you an idea of what your cost of equity is. Because after, if you don't have a cocoa issued, it's a damn difficult calculation to make. Um, right. Any other comments from the panel? I'd like to give them the last word up to a point. <laughs> no. No. Perfect. Okay. In which case, I'd like to thank them, Mr. Chris Westcott, Graham Woolvard, Peter Eisenhart, and Chris Edwards. Uh, and as I said at the start, people who have done this for real at the coalface, so the real deal, the Evander Holyfield of the finance world, if I may say so. Um, and my name is Warren Chowdhury. Thanks very much and thank you for the panel.